How it. fun has this season been so far? It's been great, man. You know, this is year number seven for me. Every single day we go to the ballpark, you feel like you have a chance to win. That has never happened here um, for me. And it's been an amazing feeling. And I got to tell you that for fans, I know they feel the same way. You're, you're never walking in feeling like, man, we have no chance today. It doesn't exist. And you know the guys are feeling that way. And that's a really good uh, feeling. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they put together a really amazing starting rotation. The lineup was good going back to last year. It's gotten even better uh, this year. And so I think, you know, sky's the limit. But this, the feeling of this season in particular is so different than previous seasons that I've been here. What has been the bigger surprise, the offense or the pitching, the starting pitching? Uh, that's a great question. Probably the offense. I think if you looked around nationally at some of the kind of previous before the season started, I think there were a lot of questions. Not, not questions like, oh, who's going to hit? We knew there was a handful of names in there. I think it was probably the rest of the lineup or the depth of the lineup. How good could they be? I don't think anybody thought um, it would be this good. Um, and that's the depth of the lineup. Again, they did a really good job at the end, kind of plugging some pieces in. Like our focus, of course, is Marcus Simeon, Adolis Garcia, Corey Seager. Uh, but it's guys like Robbie Grossman, who they signed late very inexpensively. It's Ezekiel Duran emerging, um, maybe in a way that nobody anticipated. Jonah Himes, one of the best hitters in the game. That's just as a catcher. Just one of the best hitters in the game. I'm not sure we saw it coming uh, to that level. Travis Jankowski, I don't know if you guys heard this story or not. I know he's on the IL right now. But he was told when the Rangers had those two exhibition games against Kansas City before the season started that he was not going to make the team. They thought Leo Tavares was going to be ready. He ends up making the team and plays a really important role early on, filling in, putting the ball in play. He's a great defender. He can run. Little things like that. I think the, the next level of guys beyond the big names that we all know that have made the difference for this lineup. Rangers TV analyst CJ Nitkowski joins us here on 105 Through the Fan. Uh, CJ, when you look at Dane Dunning and what he did last night and and the contributions that he's given you, whether it be in long relief or when he's gone been into the rotation, how difficult is it going to be to just you know return him to the bullpen when Jacob Degrom gets back? I mean, are they going to have to find a way to to continue continue to keep him in the rotation? I th- I don't think so. Here's why. I mean, a couple of things. One, you saw Bradford make the start on Monday. That was intentional to give everybody an extra day. Dave Denning probably then slides into that role, right? When you need, because they're going to do this, I think, throughout the year a couple of times. As good as this rotation is, a lot of the guys missed a pretty significant amount of time last year and at other points in their career. So they're being extra careful with the rotation. That was supposed to be Jake Odorizzi's role, uh, who they traded for from the Braves and unfortunately got hurt. It's going to miss the entire season. So I think you'll actually see Dane in that swing role. And, you know, to be honest, they could use him in the bullpen as well. And so the fact that you can add another starter back into the rotation, obviously someone to the level of Jacob DeGrom, and then have Dane go back into the bullpen, uh, I think that's what you'll see. I also think once that happens, it's not going to be his last start of the year. It's just a matter of when it happens. I mean, he's been so good, man. Like, his numbers are significantly better than they were a year ago. He's not letting up his. He's a silent assassin, right? He's just out there with his glasses on, going about his business with about zero emotion uh, throughout the game, and he's crushing it right now. And, again, it's another guy. It's a good example, right? We have all these big names in the rotation, and it's a guy like Dane Dunning who's playing such a critical role. What happens to, like, guys you know, to the lineup when, when, when you know, Seager comes back? Where, where's Garver fit in when he comes back? Because he's targeted at the end of the month. There's all these new great problems the Rangers have. What do we do with all of our good players? Um, and it's been a while since we've had that conversation. So a couple of things. One, I think, first of all, of course, he gets back hopefully very soon here. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen with Ezekiel Durant. Like, he has been so good. Boach loves him. Chris Boach loves him. You can tell about the way he talks about him, what we saw in spring training. And now that he's gotten that everyday opportunity, they will force him into the lineup some way. I think we'll actually see um, Corey DH a little bit if he's comfortable with it early on because uh, Durant's an excellent defender as well. And then you're going to see Durant move around and give guys certain days off. You'll see him in the outfield. They're comfortable with him playing all three outfield positions. Uh, that might move somebody else to DH. In the meantime, maybe it gives Garcia a day off of his feet where you have Durant in the outfield. So they'll be able to manage this thing. He can play third. He can play short. Uh, he can even play first once in a while. If you get a tough left-handed matchup, I know we see Nathaniel out there pretty much every day. But if there's something on paper that doesn't match up well with him and it does with Durant, you may even see him over at first base. I think the one place you won't see him is second base. And that's because Marcus Silly just doesn't take a day off. He's an absolute iron man. And so that probably, outside of an injury, let's hope we don't see it. I think that's how they work Durant. Garvin will be more of a DH. He'll probably catch, you know, 
maybe two days a week, and this is just my guess and how they'll probably work this thing. You know, Joan has done such a great job, and he is one of the best defenders in the game as well. I mean, he's just having this monster season, really, in the series. You look at Sean Murphy and Jonah Heim, you're looking at two of the best catchers in the game right now on both sides of the ball. Um, so my guess is Garver would take Sam Leon's spot right now as the backup. Um, but it, I might, again, guessing here when he catches maybe two times a week, DH is the others. Um, and there'll be some times where, where Bruce Boach is going to be in a spot where he's going to have to have a good player on the bench because you can only bat nine. I was reading an article uh, yesterday from CBS and, you know, getting close to the quarter mark of the season. Uh, and they were talking about awards candidates in, in Major League Baseball through a quarter of the way through the season. A lot still left to go. But one of the guys they mentioned as as kind of in the mix at MVP for their awards section at this point is Marcus Simeon. And, and Simeon's been so big for them, especially since Seager went down. Uh, do you think he's somebody that if this sustains and they continue to have success, we're going to be talking about Simeon come end of award season? I think so. I mean, I, I don't see why it wouldn't happen for him. He is another guy very you know, quiet and um, the way he goes about his business. And then all of a sudden you're looking up and he's just impacting the game in a big way. What he's doing with runners on scoring in scoring position is unsustainable, but it's amazing. He's well, he's hitting well over 500 right now. We actually have two guys on this club that are hitting 500 or higher with runners in scoring position. Um, to put that in perspective, we were talking about it last night. Freddie Freeman uh, led the league last year, and he hit 390, and that's an absurd number. Uh, the next closest was 360. Marcus last night going into the game was hitting, I think, 530 with runners in scoring position, and he had another hit um, last night. He has been so clutch, and you're right. It, the timing could not have been better uh, for him to get hot when Corey went down. Um, you know, he's the leader on this team, and he leads things off every night, and he's also a leader by example. We, I'd asked a lot of people before he got here, Tell me about Marcus Timmy and what can we expect? Like, you're going to love this guy. The clubhouse is going to love this guy. Uh, everything about him is you know, just it's professionalism, and we've seen it. So, yeah, he has an opportunity to be in that conversation. I think Jonah Heim has that opportunity, and we'll see where the Dolly's going to see him. Uh, and the thing that we're saying all that was real you know, possible contenders as the season goes on without mentioning uh, Corey Seager just, again, speaks to the depth of this team. Rangers TV analyst CJ Nikowski joining us here on 105 through the fan. CJ, when you, uh, you know, we, we've talked about a, a lot of good with this baseball team. The bat has been the back end of the bullpen, obviously. Uh, I think seven of their last 10 losses, the go ahead run's been scored in the seventh inning or later. Uh, you know, the, the latest attempt at, at addressing this, Joe Barlow gets recalled yesterday. Uh, is, is that going to be one of your, your new, probably eighth, ninth inning type of guys here? I don't know if he's going to jump in there right away, you know, and I don't know where his numbers were velocity wise. I was going to say, but that was the conversation. The reason that he did not make the team was the velocity was down, uh, but they had a need, and so they're going to give him a shot. I think ahead of him right now, quite honestly, is Josh Sports, and we saw him come in last night and put out a fire. And Jonathan Hernandez is looking for it right now. He's searching and, and trying to get it. He had a rough one with the home run hit by pitch and then home run. Sports comes in, the intensity is up, and he goes one, two, three, and he gets the ball to Will Smith. Uh, in the ninth inning. And so I think the guys that are emerging, Joe Bartolo's got a chance to be one of those guys. I think he's got to probably have a couple of outings first that maybe are not high leverage. I think Boach probably wants to see how it looks uh, back again in the big leagues. He was very important to this team a couple of years ago. Uh, hopefully that is the case. I'd like to see maybe this is more personal opinion, but just John King. I, I've always really liked him. I know he's had some bad breaks. He was good yesterday uh, for them with a, a one, two, three inning. He's a huge ground ball guy. The defense behind him right now is, is really good, so it's a good match. Um, and so in the meantime, you got to wait. The deadline's a long ways away. It's hard to make a trade right now. And so until then, uh, you got to figure out what you got internally and who can help. And that will probably be an ongoing process. But I, if I were to identify a couple of guys right now um, that I think maybe could be that those next step guys that maybe get some opportunities in some bigger situations, uh, I'd say it's probably going to be Josh Boers. And, and for me, I'd like to see maybe uh, John King get a look, too. Should we feel positive, negative, or somewhere in the middle over DeGrom's start? I feel positive. The fact that he's been out there playing catch. I mean, as far as his next start coming? No, just his overall beginning of his Ranger career. Injuries factored oh. in with the effectiveness. Like, we're like, okay, are these the signs of it? But obviously when he's out there, he's lights out. So, like, is... How are you feeling about the overall beginning? Yeah, I'd say this it's probably how it looks, right? I mean, to be honest with you, going forward, he is so ridiculously dominant in what he does. It has been an absolute treat uh, to watch him in our uniform. Uh, but he is th almost 35 years old. I hope he's 35 in June. And there's an injury history there. And, you know, you look at his body type, right? He's long and he's lean and he's doing things that 
almost don't make physical sense as far as the velocity and where he sits and that tremendous slider that he has. And so I, I think this is part of it. I think part of what we will get with Jacob DeGrom is being cautious. He understands his body really well. What the Rangers did uh, so well this offseason was to make sure that they had the pieces in place where they did not feel like they had to push hard on him right now because they're going to want to do that come postseason time, right? That's the plan here is to get to the postseason and have Jacob DeGrom lead the way in October. In the meantime, you got to be a little bit careful uh, when you get there. And so that's why depth is so important. That's why Dane Dunning is so important uh, to this team and other guys that may get opportunities to take starts is to make sure that we can give the other guys the breaks that they need, the lead dogs. Uh, Jacob DeGrom is, is obviously one of them, but man, when he's out there, it is something special. And, uh, and so far, so good. And I think the Rangers are just being a little bit extra cautious right now um, because, of course, again, you, just, you need them for the long term. You need them late in the season. All right, two hot-button issues that we need your opinion on. Uh, All right. Don't know how you approached it on television, but Jared Sandler just jinxing the hell out of John Gray's no-hitter <laughs> on the radio. I know you always have nice things to say about our boy when they show mm-hmm. him, when y'all show him on TV. So that's one, the no-hitter approach in the booth. And number two, the Aaron Judge controversy. So I'd say this on the no-hitter. For me, Dave and I were just talking about this yesterday. Um, we're in on talking about it. Because the last thing you want to do, like, you know, for, for those of us who are diehards, right, we're watching the game all the time. We know what's going on. For the casual viewer who either has the game on on the radio, say, in the car, or it's on the television in the background and you kind of have to pay attention, you may have no idea what's going on because you haven't heard it said. And we don't want that, right? We want people to listen to the game. We want people to watch the game. And Dave used the example because he was, Dave was telling a funny story about an interview he had years ago with another organization uh, that, that was Seattle. And Phil Shadini was just doing a perfect game. And there was much made about uh, one of their broadcasters never really giving it away. And Dave was unaware that that was the case. So they were asking him about, you know, how would you handle this? And he kind of went off about the whole thing. He said, of course, you got to bring it up. You got to talk about it. You got to let the viewers know, which was, opposite of what they wanted to hear in that interview <laughs> uh, in the moment, which is great because then he ended up here and now we get to work together. So it worked out well for me that, that he popped the top of that situation. But I think you should talk about it. It's not to say they have to go crazy about it, but you want to make sure that fans are informed because they may not be paying as close attention as most of us do. And you hate to be like, you know, kind of listening to the game in your car and half listening and you, know, you get home and then, you, you know, you walk in and the game's not on, you find out John Gray threw a no-hitter. And you're like, man, how come? Uh, why didn't the announcer ever mention when I was in the car this guy had a no-hitter going? I may have been more excited about if I stayed the car a little longer, about I went inside and turned the game on. I think it's our responsibility um, to bring it up. If you have a uniform on, I mean, that to me is where it ends. You don't say a word. You don't talk to the guy. I've certainly been in that position many times. But I think our responsibility as broadcasters, bring it up, let fans know what's going on, give them a reason to be excited, give them a reason to stay tuned in and not walk away and do something else. Regarding Aaron Judge, man, we went through this on my radio show when I said yesterday, and I was asking Ryan Spielborg, a um, long-time outfitter, I count on him, man, because, you know, he knows hitting. And I'm like, dude, it looks to me like he's peeking at the catcher. And he didn't seem to think so. And I know Aaron Judge's response was looking in the dugout, almost as if he, you know, he's the coach in that club, like almost like he wanted to reprimand the guys. Um, and I know you can't call timeout nearly as much as you want to, but the way he did it, to me, that, that's not going to send that message that he's looking for, right? The side eye that you can't even see necessarily from the dugout. So I really want to believe him because he's such a stand-up guy. Uh, he's, you know, I know that he's an opponent. He's not fun to face, but he, he's certainly a guy that is respected throughout the game. We'll see. Major League Baseball said no investigation, nothing nefarious going on. Um, they're not going to break, you know, both the coaches' chops down and saying you got to be in that box all the time. But I was a little suspicious. Um, because even the greatest of guys and the nicest of guys, uh, we're all looking for an edge we got the uniform on. Thank you, man. Keep up the fantastic work. Congratulations on the bragging rights over the wife, and we'll be uh, watching again tonight. Thank you, CJ. I appreciate it, guys. Have a great day.